Well, let's go for a drive in the country. Now, we sort of have to set the scene here a little bit, I think. So let's say we're in a place that's either semi-arid or humid because I want some water around and to grow things. Uh, we'll stay out of the desert because the deserts are a little bit different, and then we might get in another lecture talking about why deserts look like they do. But anyway, let's say we're out driving around the country in a typical humid or semi-arid region, and we're looking at a slope now that's less than 40 degrees. It's less than that angle of repose. What should it look like? Well, what it should look like, it, it ought to be covered with regolith because, remember, less than 40 degrees, there's, the go force is not great enough to cause it to go, the stay force is too great, and so it ought to be covered with regolith. And the reason why I want a little bit of moisture around, because I want perhaps plants to be growing on it, and if you're in a semi-arid region, the plants we're talking about may be grasses and things like that. And if you're a more humid region, you'll have other things like trees and the whole bit. So in other words, it should be vegetated. So if you drive along and you look at a vegetated hillside and then just look at the angle, invariably you'll see, yeah, that, that is less than 40 degrees. And here's how you can tell. I always tell my students it's a good test as to what the hillside slope really is, how close it's approaching the angle of, of repose. If it's less than the angle of repose, you ought to be able to walk over to it and just walk up the hillside. Because remember now, the stay force is greater than the go force, and of course it's acting on you too. So think about hiking around the hills or whatever, maybe you're a camp or whatever. As long as you can walk up a hillside, that means it's less than the angle of repose. But on the other hand, as it starts to approach the angle of repose, you can probably still walk up it, but you're going to do some huffing and puffing. But if it's greater than the angle of repose, you're not going to walk up that hillside. Why? Because the go force is working on you too, and you're going to slide back down again. So anyway, you look at this slope, and if it's covered with vegetation, and then you say, well, yeah, that's the reason why, because it's, it's less than the angle of repose. On the other hand, let's say you're driving along, and you see a slope that's steeper than the angle of repose. Maybe it's though maybe 50 degrees or whatever. What is it going to look like? Well, as it gets greater than the angle of repose now, what's going to happen, some of that regolith is going to start sliding off because the go force now is bigger than the stay force. So what's going to happen is the, as the regolith slides off, you're going to be able to start to see some rock sticking out and the steeper it gets beyond 40 degrees, the rocks become more and more apparent and there's less and less regolith. You may have a, a little vegetation here and there and cracks in the rocks, but as it gets steeper and steeper, think about getting finally to the typical road cut. The typical road cut is, is pretty steep and if you look at it, it's just stacks of rocks. That's matter of fact, that's why geologists love, love road cuts. Uh, we, <laughs> there's a joke of something about that ge geologists look at road cuts as tourist sites. Places where tourists go, well, the tourists really don't, but they do. There are some places I, I can just think around here where people go to see those outcrops because they're so interesting. Well, anyway, it should be barren of, of regolith and the rock should stick out. And that's what you see. That's exactly what you see as you drive around the countryside. So it looks like all the things we've been talking about here in terms of the angle of repose and the go forces and the stay forces, they work. Well, yes and no. Um, for example, uh, note, if the slope is less than the angle of repose, what that's really saying is that regolith will not move. Why? The stay force is too great. But here's the problem, though. The problem is the definition of mass wasting, it's movement of regolith on slopes, period. It doesn't say anything about the angle of slope. The implication is, as long as the slope is not horizontal, where remember now, nothing can move, as long as it's not horizontal, if it has any angle at all, it's going to be moving. But how can that be? Because on those slopes of less than the angle of repose, the go force is not big enough. Well, here's the bottom line. I don't care about all that stuff we've been talking about. If something is moving down slope, the go force has got to be greater than the stay force. That's just the bottom line. Well, then we have to explain that. Well, how can you do that? You've got a slope that's less than the angle of repose? How can the go force possibly be greater than the stay force? Well, I, I guess the two possibilities are something happened that caused the go force to increase or it caused the stay force to decrease. Uh, is that possible? Well, let's talk about the go force increasing. Remember now, 
the go force is that side of the box parallel to the slope. If you want to increase the go force, the magnitude of that side of the box, well, the only way you can do that is to increase the diagonal of the box to make the box bigger. Well, note what the diagonal of the box is. The diagonal of that box was the force of gravity or the weight of the object. So you're saying in order to get the go force to increase, you got to increase the weight of the object. I mean, we're talking a, a big hunk of rock now. Rocks don't gain weight. You know, they just don't. Besides, if you increase one side of the box, the go force, the other side increases too. So while the go force is increasing, so is the, the force of cohesion and friction or the stay force. So you see, that's not going to work. Well, how about decreasing, how about decreasing the stay force? Now remember, the stay force is just cohesion and friction. Question, can you decrease cohesion and friction? Yeah, yeah, you can decrease cohesion and friction. For example, what I do in my car and you do in your car, you put oil in the, in the engine. Why? You put it in there? Well, you put it in there to de decrease cohesion and friction between the moving parts. The deal is, let's say you have moving parts moving by each other, say a, a piston and a cylinder. If you don't have some kind of a lubricant now and they're right up against each other, they're eventually going to just stick together because they're going to gall in there. But note, if you put a lubricant in there, just the thinnest film is all you need. Now, note they're not in contact anymore. There's no cohesion. You've eliminated cohesion. And then what a lubricant's all about, just because of the stuff itself, it minimizes the amount of friction. So the idea is, add a lubricant. That's what lubricants do. That decreases cohesion and friction. That's, that's the stay force. So how about that slope? Can we decrease cohesion and friction on that slope? Well, I guess you could spray with oil, but I don't think the EPA would like that. But the question I would have for you is, is there out there in nature uh, a liquid uh, that may, would make a good lubricant? And the answer, of course, is yes. It's water. How many times, for example, have you stepped out of a bathtub or out of a shower onto a wet tile floor and slipped? You step out. The problem is, you see, here's your foot. And here's the tile floor, but in between the two, that's thin film of water, no cohesion, no friction, you see, and almost down you go. How many times have you heard a, a, a guard at the swimming pool screaming at some kid, don't run? Why? Because as long as the kid is running around and a little dry foot is coming in contact with the dry pavement, you're okay. But as soon as that little dry foot hits that puddle of water and all of a sudden there's a thin film of water between that little dry foot and the pavement, you got no cohesion, you got no friction, the kid's going down and the parents are on the phone to the lawyer. So that's the way it works. So lubricant, the lubricant we're looking for is water. So here's the deal. Think about now any one of those drawings we talked about where the stay force was greater than the go force. If you start adding water, effectively what you're doing, you're taking that side of the box and making it smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, I don't care how small the go force is, if you add enough water, you're going to eliminate that. You're going to eliminate the stay force to the point where the go force is going to be greater. And as a result, it's going to start moving. So there's the secret. Water is the answer in, in moving things on slopes less than the angle of repose. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a chart that I put together to show all the different kinds of mass wastings. And the classification scheme is pretty much based upon how much water is available. And the, the different kinds are broken down into flows, slides, and falls. Flows, if you look at the chart, the big difference between the three, flows require quite a bit of water, quite a bit. Slides, they require some water, but not literally as much as flows, of course, but they require water too, but not as much as flows. And then falls, if you look at falls, falls don't require hardly any water at all. So that's the fundamental difference now between the different kinds of groupings of mass wasting processes. Now, what I'd like to do in, in the conclusion in this, in this particular lecture, let's talk about some of these processes of mass wasting some of which you've seen obviously, others which are going on all the time and you've never known about it. So let's take flows first. Well, let's take the first one, one that we've already talked about. We've talked about mud flows. The mud flows in case of a volcanic eruption, it was called a lahar. A lahar is a mud flow that is specifically associated with a volcanic eruption. So the picture was very simple. 
Here you have a volcanic eruption. This now would be of the andesitic type now. This is talk, we're talking here, one of the guys along the arc volcanoes. Lots of explosions, lots of dust and stuff being thrown up in the air, the very fine material. Well, very, very often, these peaks we're talking about erupting, they're high enough to have snow and ice at the summit. So right off the bat, of course, that's going to be melting right off the bat, generating lots and lots of water. So there's a source of water now for our flow. Another source, however, is torrential rains. It is not uncommon during volcanic eruptions to have torrential rains. Why? Well, there seems to be some disturbance of the atmosphere, as you might suspect, above this erupting cone. And between the two, between the torrential rains that's generated just by virtue of the disturbing of the atmosphere and the melting of any snow and ice that happen to be around, all that water mixes in with all that very, very fine material and forms a mud which roars off the mountainside. Now, we talked about, remember, uh, with one notable exception, mass wasting processes normally simply went from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. This is, of course, the one exception to the rule. Those mud flows can come down off the mountainside and flow for hundreds of miles, possibly. For example, we, we made the point that in the, the eruption of Mount St. Helens, uh, it was a mud flow that caused most of the damage in Mount St. Helens eruption, not the explosion itself. Knocked down trees, but remember they were harvested. Remember, the, it was a mud flow that destroyed Herculaneum. So that would be an example of a flow. Obviously, the name even says flow. So that would be an example of flow. Lots and lots of water involved in that one. But let me give you another one. Now, I suspect, unless you are a polar explorer, chances are you're not going to see this one. But let me give you a sort of a picture now. We are in uh, the, the tundra region, uh, up north toward the pole. We're up in northern Canada now. The tundra is a place where there are plants growing, very small plants, mosses, and I'm not a botanist now, but you understand the little plants growing. There is a soil profile of sorts, and there is a small, perhaps, thickness of regolith, okay, the soil in the regolith. Now, during most of the year, this is frozen solid because we have permafrost. Well, it's not quite permanent permafrost because during a very, very brief summer, this upper level, maybe the upper six inches, maybe a foot, will thaw. Well, so now all the ice you see is turned now into water. But where's the water going to go? It can't go down because you've got ice down there. It's, it's permafrost down below, you see. So here's this water with really no place to go. So what does it do? It just permeates throughout the regolith and gets in between the bits and pieces of whatever is in there and decreases cohesion, uh, reduces friction. There's no stay force. And all of a sudden, Regardless of what the go force is, it starts moving. The process is called solifluxion. Solifluxion. Now, here's the interesting thing about solifluxion, talking about moving on very shallow angles of slope. You can actually have solifluxion going on on slopes as low as one or two degrees. Now, the significance of one or two degrees. Your eye and mine could not picture that as a slope. Our eyes are not good enough to perceive a slope of one or two degrees. A slope of one or two degrees would be to us perfectly horizontal. So here's a material moving now on a surface that's almost horizontal. Remember now, if it were horizontal, it would not move. Nothing moves on a horizontal surface. But solid fluxion can operate on surfaces that low and it just starts to move down slope. Of course, the steeper the slope gets, the faster it moves. But that would be another example of a flow. You need lots and lots and lots of water for that stuff. Well, okay, let's go on to the next one, the, the slides now. We need some water here, but we don't need as much as we did before. But let me talk about uh, three of them. Two of them sort of go hand in hand. Uh, in the little chart, you'll see there's a thing called a debris slide and a rock slide. Now, here's fundamentally the difference between a debris slide and a rock slide. The two together are referred to commonly as a landslide. Now, you all use the term landslide. The thing is, landslide is not a geological term. We use the term rock slide or debris slide, but I have to admit we use landslide too. It's just a very convenient term to use because people can visualize exactly what you're talking about. But if you want to get into details, it's either a rock slide or a debris slide. Now, the difference between the two. The difference is simply in the, the size of the largest particles that are being moved. If, for example, the largest particles would be bigger than, say, the size of a desk, 
then it would be a rock slide. And there's no upper limit, of course. So in other words, if you have lots of particles coming down that are the size of a desk or greater, and that's not really a scientific measurement, I guess, but you get the picture, then we're talking rock slide. On the other hand, if the particles are less large than that, uh, smaller than that, then we would call it a debris slide. So here's the scenario. A typical scenario would be a fairly steep slope, greater than the angle of repose now, rock surface sticking out all kinds of rocks, and what we're going to do now, we're going to talk about weathering shortly. And one of the big processes of weathering that's really effective, probably the most effective, is the freezing of water and changing into ice. It expands 10%, lots of forces. So the picture I would uh, present for you would be a hillside, rocks exposed, being subjected to freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw, free, a cyclic freeze-thaw. Every time it freezes, the water in these little cracks freezes and expands 10%, and the crack is just a little teeny bit wider now. And then when the thaw comes, more water flows in, and then it freezes again. So if we go through that freeze-thaw cycle, and let's do it for a long time. Let's do it for 10 years, 50 years. Who knows how long it takes? But over a period of 50 years, let's say, you can break up an awful lot of rocks. So picture at the end now, at the end where we're about ready to have a landslide down, we have this surface. It's broken up as a result of physical weathering process. It's literally just hanging there, but there's still enough cohesion and still enough friction between the individual particles, the bits and pieces of rock, as big as they may be, to keep it in place. All we need now, hmm, a little bit of water would do it. Let's get rid of some of that cohesion. Let's get rid of some of that friction, and that thing could come down. Typically, when would that be? Well, I'm thinking of the, only, of the area around here. When do we get most of our rainfall? Uh, when are the streams rising the best? Well, it's in the springtime. Think about the spring coming now. We have the, the spring thaw. We have the ice and snow all melting away. And then we have the spring rains come. Now, these don't even have to be torrential, but normally, very commonly, you know, they rain day after day after day. And now here, this hillside, precariously sitting there, all broken up, and now becomes saturated with water. Sooner or later, there's enough of it where there's enough cohesion reduced and enough friction reduced, the whole thing takes off, and all of a sudden, you've got a debris slide or a rock slide or a landslide. Where does it go? It goes out on the roadway, you see. Think about driving around, certainly this part of the world. When do you see most of the rocks sitting along the edge of the road and perhaps out on the road itself? It's in the springtime. Now, granted, you can have one of these rock falls anytime. But I'm just saying that if you think about it, most of the time you see that sort of stuff is in the spring of the year. And what you're looking at is the result of perhaps 10, 50 years or, or more of just freeze-thaw, breaking the rocks up in the hillside, and then just one spring event, just to the point where the cohesion and friction are reduced, no stay force, and down it comes. So that would be a classic example of a mass wasting process. That's one that you've all seen. And that, that's the one I used when I said, if it wasn't for a landslide, most people wouldn't even know there was such a thing as mass wasting at all. Well, uh, let's talk about another one. And I want to talk about this one because I think in terms of the total amount of, of stuff moved by mass wasting, this one has to be the winner. It's called creep. Right off the bat now, the picture is this stuff is going to move really slowly. And this is one of the reasons why you or most people don't really know what's going on. It's moving the stuff so slowly that even with year to year, you probably don't even notice any difference. But we have to look at it over a period of time. So let's get started, show you how this thing works. Uh, to do that, the first thing I want to talk about is another process that you've, you've seen, maybe didn't call it this, but it's called frost heaving. Now here's the picture now. Picture, if you will, uh, your garden, any place where soil is exposed. I'm trying to get away from saying the word dirt now, you see. The soil is exposed. And we're probably in, uh, let's say it's, it's getting into fall now. You're starting to have the, the nighttime freezes. And we're going to go through freeze-thaw cycles even before we get into winter. And here's what happens. In that upper layer of the soil, there's moisture, of course, water. And what happens is that during the night, when things freeze, ice crystals start to grow just below the surface. Now remember, anytime crystals grow, 
there is a thing the chemists refer to as a growth pressure. What the growth pressure is, again, it's simply a force that crystals generate, the purpose of which is to shove anything out of the way that gets in the way so they continue to extend themselves. So we have this growth pressure. The growth pressure is enough to lift any particle of soil that happens to be un over top of it up in the air. Now here's the important part about these crystals though. They always grow perpendicular to the surface. Now don't ask me why, because I've asked an awful lot of experts, supposedly experts, why is that the case? Why is it always perpendicular? And I've never gotten a good answer. So picture anyway, perpendicular crystals growing, they're only going to be maybe a quarter of an inch or half an inch long, lifting that surface up. That's the freeze cycle. And then the sun comes out the next morning and the ice crystals melt and that little layer of soil falls back down again. And then the next layer, next time it freezes up, then next thaw it down, and so up, down, up, down. That's basically frost heaving now. You say, boy, that can't really do much. Well, maybe not on that horizontal surface, but let's change, this changes scenario. Let's say we picture the same thing going on, but this time on a slope. Now here's a crystal starting to grow. Remember, always perpendicular to the slope. So here's the slope, grows perpendicular. It lifts this particle of dirt up. Oh, soil up, sorry. <laughs> it lifts this particle of soil up, okay, again, maybe a quarter of an inch, maybe a half an inch, and then the sun comes out. Question, does that particle of soil go back from whence it came? Au contraire. What happens is gravity takes over and it falls straight down. So note the particle now is down slope, just a very small distance, but it's down slope further than it was before. And so note, as we go through repeated freeze-thaw, 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 that little particle is slowly but surely moving downhill. Well, it isn't just that particle, it's everybody doing that. So very slowly, the entire hill is very slowly moving downhill. That's what creep's all about. Now that's in the winter time, okay? What happens the rest of the year? How about summer and spring and fall? Well, in summer and spring and fall, we have rains. And we don't have to talk about torrential rains here. This is the average everyday rain comes. The rain soaks into the ground. And as it soaks down into the ground, it gets in between these little particles of soil. And it reduces some of the cohesion, not all of it, but some of the cohesion, some of the friction. And as a result, those little particles, every time it rains, can move a little bit further again. So it doesn't make any difference what time of the year you're talking about. The particles are moving down slope. Now again, at a creep, so this is a process that will be very, very difficult to measure the actual rate. But here's what you've seen, I'm sure, that's the result of creep over periods of years. For example, fence posts. You drive out in the country, for example, and you see fence posts tilted over on their side like that. I doubt very much whether the farmer put them in that way. I think the farmer put them in vertically, but note what happens over a period of tens of years, that slow movement of the slope above just sort of pushed the thing over and pivoted on the bottom, so now the fence post is tilted. That's the result of basically just, just downward creep. Here's another one. Oh, of course, they always show the tombstones. That's a great one in textbooks, so the tombstones tipping over. Well, that's the same thing. But here's another one. How many of you have seen trees with the bent bottoms on them, like that on hillsides? What causes that bending? Well, here's one thing that certainly could cause it. When there was a little baby tree throwing down its roots, trying to establish itself, the roots were pretty much in that moving zone, that very, very dynamic zone. And here the tree is trying to grow toward the sun. Remember phototropism? Thou shalt grow toward the sun. But at the same time, the hillside was pushing it over. So by the time the roots got down below that moving zone and finally anchored themselves into solid rock, if you will, or at least stuff that wasn't moving, by that time the bottom of the tree has been bent. So that we have these bends and a thing like that. But there's one I want to talk about that's even more practical than that. And this one, I always tell my students, these are things I want you to put in the back of your mind because maybe someday in the future you can use this and, and save you an awful lot of grief and, and money too. For example, how many times have you driven around a neighborhood, depending upon where you live now, and seen walls tipped over? That's what tips walls over. What walls are tipping over, it's just simply the push of creep above, up the slope, is pushing the wall over. Why is the wall being pushed over? The reason why is because whoever built the wall didn't build it properly. If you want to build a wall that withstands the effort of creep now, this is a potent force. Here's what you do. What you do, let's say you want your wall to be in a certain position. 
and there's a hill behind it. You want to extend this hill back so you can put a patio in or whatever. So if you want your wall in a certain position, what you want to do is to dig the hillside back maybe another foot or maybe two feet beyond where the wall is going to be constructed. Now the deal is whenever you start constructing your wall, here's what you do. You attach to the wall and extend back into that space what is called a dead man. What a dead man is, is simply anything that extends from the wall back in a dead space. It could be strap iron, it could be an angle iron. If it's a, it's a wooden fence kind of thing, one of those post walls, it could be a, a, like a Lincoln log going back into the hillside. And as you put them back, you start filling that area back there with crushed rock. And every time you put another layer of the wall up, you put another couple of dead men back there. So when you're finally done, the wall now consists of the wall you look at, all the dead men because they're attached to that wall, back into that crushed rock, and all of that becomes part of the wall because they're all connected by virtual friction, you see. So now your wall is really this massive unit of the wall that you see and all that crushed rock behind. Now the force of creep coming down, there's no way it's going to tip that whole thing over because there's just too much mass for it. What's going to happen, as a matter of fact, your lawn or whatever happens to be above is actually going to come down and spill over the edge of your wall. What you're going to end up doing once in a while is going back and sort of clipping the thing off. But you see, that's what you've got to do. If you build your wall that way, you will never have to worry about rebuilding it again because it'll outlive well, I don't want to say the odd live you, but it'll be it'll last a very, very long time. So that would be a good example of creep. Creep is important because this is the one that moves more stuff than anything. Think about it. That process we just described is going on on every slope that's covered with regolith everywhere in the world. Landslides are located to a, a particular spot. The other things a, a lahar is located to a particular stream valley, but creep is everywhere. And so I, that's why I say it's the most important of all, because when it comes down to moving stuff, this has got to be the one that moves more material, more regolith than any of the others. I won't go as far as to say all the others combined, but it is, within, within my mind at least, the most important of all these. Now, uh, on to falls. This is a really pretty simple thing. A rock fall is a rock fall. You can just picture this thing. But here's the point to be made again. You don't need much water for this stuff. That's the bottom line. And there is only one fall. It's simply called a rock fall. But again, here's the picture. And I'm sure a lot of you have visualized this one and seen this one. Here we have a road cut. Let's picture a road cut now. And here's a rock ledge sticking out. Chances are, and certainly in this area, what that rock ledge is, it's a layer of sandstone or maybe a layer of limestone. Uh, surrounded by shales. Remember, the shales are the most abundant of all. So here's this layer of uh, sandstone, let's say, sticking out. All rocks have cracks in them. We're going to talk about it in another lecture. We call them joints, but they're cracks. All rocks have these cracks to begin with. So here's the picture. The picture is just a little bit of water is all we need now. Gets down into that crack. And now, again, it's just the old freeze-thaw thing. It's frost wedging once again. And all you need to do is put a little bit of water, you see, freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing. And over again, a period maybe of 10 or 20 years, it's going to take a while, but pretty soon the crack within that layer gets so big that they interconnect. And now all of a sudden you've got this great hunk of rock that's not connected to anybody anymore. It's not connected to the layer of rock of which it was a part. Now it's simply sitting there precariously. Simply a little bit of friction and contact, a little bit of cohesion, just holding it there. Maybe a little bit of soil around it, you see, sort of keeping in place. And then what happens? Well, what happens then, you bring on the old spring rains once again. The water gets down through there, eliminates cohesion, eliminates friction, and down it comes. And where does it end up? It ends up in the roadway, or it ends up along the roadside. Again, when do you see things like that along the roadway? You see them most in the springtime. I'm just thinking driving down here, it's spring. They were all over the place. Do you see them in the winter? Do you see them in the fall? Do you see them in the summer? Well, occasionally, but most of the time you see in the spring. So the point is, look around you like that. Watch for things like that. This is all a process, mass wasting, that most people don't even know is going on. And it's doing wondrous things. As a matter of fact, in, the, in, in lectures to come, we're gonna find out that it is one of the major components major processes, major sources of energy to sculpt the land to make it look 
like it does. But that's the topic of an, another lecture, which we'll get to later.